Tonight on News Live at 6, student government seats up for grabs. Student Association wants to hear your voice. We'll tell you how to get involved. And snow has moved out of central New York, but what's up next? I'll have your full five-day forecast. There, there, there's a question of um, whether or not the accessibility is actually improving with this, this form of open access. Library agreement may delay the publishing of academic articles as author fees increase. This TV News Live at 6, your campus news leader. It's time to run for office here on campus. Good evening, I'm Walker Simmons. And I'm Nicole LaPonte. Today is the day to start getting involved. Well, it's time to run for office here on campus, and the Student Association election session has multiple representative and executive seats up for grabs. Our Student Association beat reporter, Brandon Meyer, is joining us live tonight. Brandon, good evening. I'm here in Eggers Hall where the fourth and final student association election information session will be kicking off in just under an hour. Now with election season beginning, I spoke with the chair of the Board of Elections, Otto Sutton, on what students can expect and why they should care. There's a lot of pertinent issues and relevant change that Student Association enacts on this campus. I think, you know, think of free laundry or menstrual products in the bathrooms. That's the work that Student Association's done. And so just because you don't always see it, it doesn't always have Student Association's label on it. There's a lot of relevant and impactful work that is carried out by the student government. Each candidate was required to fill out an intent to petition, which allows the university to make sure they are in good academic standing. Now that the deadline is passed, candidates will file out a letter of intent which lists what their qualifications are and why they decided to run. We're also planning um, to sort of formulate an election booklet, um, sort of taking students through how the election works, the various processes, and then compiling all the candidates and all their information and platforms in a booklet. Even though the next election event is not until March 23rd with the executive debate, students can still get to know who's running. This way to get involved is to pay attention for when um, students start filing petitions and start, um, you know, those headshots and letters of intent coming through. Um, we've seen people come with a lot of background experience and students who um, haven't been in student association and, um, you know, really don't have that same type of experience. And, you know, one's not better than the other. I think, um, you know, a student that brings enthusiasm and passion for other students at this campus, um, you know, that's a good starting point for, you um, being able to help other students here. Now, as we see these election booklets and letters of intent rolling out to students, we're going to get a picture of exactly how many candidates we're going to see on March 23rd. But Otto says there's definitely a lot more candidates than last election. Reporting live in Eggers Hall, Brandon Myers, Citrus TV News. Brandon, thank you. New details tonight. So we all took some version of FYS 100, but if you're interested in leading it next semester, well, here's your chance. Applications open today through March 20th, and if you want to learn more about what the job entails, the first information session just ended, but there's more coming. They'll be next Wednesday, March 18th at 10 in the morning in the NVRC Thursday, March 16th at 2 on Zoom, and the last one is Monday, March 12th from 1 to 2 in the Hall of Languages. Well, in just about a week, we'll be celebrating International Women's Day. It's March 8th, and on campus, this year's theme is about embracing equity. The university is inviting students, faculty, and staff of all genders to enter this year's International Women's Day contest. To enter, you can submit a photo of you embracing equity on the website below, or you can also share a story about a woman who's inspired you. And new information tonight, the Genesee Grand Hotel is being torn down to make way for student housing. It'll be a five-story student apartment building with 145 units. It'll be on East Genesee Street, two blocks north of campus. The Mayflower Hotel is next to it, and it will remain. We'll have more details as they start to come in. Well, Syracuse University libraries are about to get a lot bigger. With newly passed read and publish agreements, it's easier than ever to access previously paywalled material. This is going to make almost all academic resources available with open access. Additionally, journals will begin to discontinue user subscriptions. 
Our Annalise Piamonte spoke with Dylan Moore, SU Library's Open Scholarship Librarian, about these changes. Annalise, how does this affect authors who are in the process of publishing their work? Well, these reduce cost. There's authors and access. This can cost thousands. So it limits the amount of authors can. And this is where libraries like Bird step into play. Instead of focusing on paying for the subscription fees, libraries like SU will also pay for author funding. Librarian Dylan Moore explains. Journals are shifting that fee that was once attached to the readers and moving it over to the authors. Um, the world of what they can read and have access to is massively opened. And as we talked about last time, COVID was really the accelerator of this, that the need to get scientific research out about what was going on with COVID um, saved lives. Years ago, but we've come even further from library inaccessibility 15 to 20 years ago. Back then, when you graduated, your papers did too. Not anymore. However, issues are may arise in other institutions in underprivileged areas where libraries lack the funding to provide for these authors. There, there may be a rise in inaccessibility. However, librarians like Dylan want students to remember that we are affluent here on campuses like SU and that they're always supported. I'm Annalise Piamonti. Walker, Nicole, back to you. Annalise, thank you so much. This agreement truly proves how important libraries can be for students here on campus. Yeah, you're telling me. Well, hopefully the weather proves well, it's nicer to I'm, get to This libraries. weather will make you want to stay in a library. Yeah, it's brutal it's true. Out right oh, now. no, it's been so bad. I forgot what the sun looks like. Me too. Hopefully with some good news. Cross my fingers here. Ron, what do we got? Well, Walker, I wish I could tell you that sun was going to come out because I'll tell you what, I would just love that. I'd probably just grab a chair, pack my picnic lunch, and go out on the quad. But unfortunately, the clouds are going to remain over central New York for a little bit longer. The good news is, though, that snow that was here earlier this morning, this afternoon, that has cleared out as well as the rain. You kind of saw like a snow to rain transition. And that was just because those temperatures rose a little bit. And that's going to stay with us going into tomorrow. We're at 35 degrees right now as we look outside under a significant amount of cloud cover here in the Syracuse area. And that will stay with us tonight. Going into tomorrow, though, it's going to start out dry. Temperatures when you wake up around 29 degrees and then increasing so that it's warm enough that we get rain. Spot showers on and off tomorrow. So definitely grab the raincoat and maybe a sweatshirt under it because it's going to be a very damp day, kind of feeling a bit more like November than the, uh, the 1st of March. Temperatures falling tomorrow night, but things uh, looking a little bit better for the later half of the weekend. I'll have that and more coming up. Nicole and Walker, back over to you guys. Ronnie, thank you. New tonight, a former Onondaga County police officer will not face any charges for interfering in his sister's DWI arrest. Officer Milton Sustash Jr. was accused of responding in a marked SBD car and uniform and involving himself in the case. Well, Officer Sustash resigned from office last week to avoid criminal charges. He was also decertified as a law enforcement officer, meaning he can no longer work as an officer in the state. In the investigation, Sustash was accused of conspiring with EMS to push IV fluids into through his sister's veins in an attempt to lower her BAC. And new details tonight. The man who abandoned his five-month-old daughter at Salt City Market last month is in custody. 26-year-old Justin Hughes left her on the floor of a hallway where a market worker found her wrapped in a pink blanket. Well, the Salvation Army had reported the baby and her mother missing after the 21-year-old made suicidal posts on Facebook. The next day, January 18th, police say Alice Fenton returned to the shelter without her baby. That's because the father had taken the baby and abandoned her at the market. Well, tomorrow, additional benefits many on the SNAP program received as a result of the pandemic are set to expire. Right now, about 40 million people nationwide receive these benefits. Almost 3 million of those are right here in New York. Now, the additional benefits gave households an extra $95 per month at the least. The Food Bank of Central New York is bringing its mobile food pantry to Syracuse tomorrow. It'll be at Cummings Field in the Eastwood section at 3. And students at SUNY schools like ESF and others across the state could be experiencing tuition hikes. SUNY Chancellor John King defended proposed tuition hikes on the system's campuses. And there's no, there is space in Governor Kathy's Hochul budge, budget for this. Well, tuition in both the SUNY and City University of New York systems have been frozen since the start of COVID. Hochul said last month that she'd authorize slight annual increases at most state schools, leading to possible increases of just over 100 to a few hundred dollars. 
Marshmallows are being picked off off Route 5 in Camillus after 20 boxes of the fluffy treat fell off a truck. At noon today, at least two people called the Onondaga 911 Center to warn them about this sticky situation. This is just wild to me. <laughs> I mean, I'm happy everyone's okay, but how often do you hear marshmallows falling off of a truck? I mean, that'll really get you questioning things driving down Route 5 and you see boxes of marshmallows. I know, right? Making some s'mores. Yeah, you gotta, right? you know, pick, put them in your trunk and <laughs> s'mores for dinner. Of course. Well, coming up on News Live at 6, a surveillance program used for national security is being renewed. Find out what that means for you next. And still ahead, new technology may be able to help alleviate racial disparities in medicine, how it can help abuse victims. Jason, let's go see your room. What do you think? We kept it a little spare, so you can decorate it how you like. Dinner! There you go. Excellent. Soccer is fun. Yeah, I saw you guys out there. of Live from Studio B. You're watching Citrus TV News Live at 6 with Nicola Ponte, Walker Simmons, and Ronnie Perillo. Now, your campus news leader continues. Welcome back to News Live at 6. A former forensic nurse has found that blue and purple light can help detect bruises on darker skinned individuals. This inclusive research could help victims of sexual assault and domestic violence get the care and justice they deserve. Citrus TV reporter Anna Salevich reports. Catherine Scafidi says it was difficult to see injuries on darker skinned patients when she was working as a forensic nurse. She told NPR this limited what she could report in the medical records that were often used as evidence in criminal investigations. Scafidi and her team at George Mason University have found that blue and purple light can help identify bruises on people with dark skin. Syracuse University Biology and Forensic and National Security Sciences Professor Dr. Robert Silver says this new research is a critical step toward helping everyone. Silver asked not to be filmed as a safety measure associated with some of the work that he does. I don't care the color of your skin, where you were born, I don't care any of that. You're needing help. I need to be able to provide that. Silver says he became aware of this racial disparity while working on a majority African-American crime unit in Detroit. He says that even though this light technology is a step in the right direction, it still needs scientific evaluation before it can be used in a court of law. Silver says these lights are just the first step of a long process that requires a lot of supporting evidence. SU junior Courtney Toxie says forensic methods prior to this research amplify the impacts of racism. But sometimes you don't really see how it can affect your personal life. And so I think those who don't have it happen to them, those who, who don't experience those mistakes will never understand how impactful those mistakes can be on a person's life. Toxie says the black community has always been a step behind in the world of medicine. For Citrus TV News, I'm Anna Salevich. 
Anna, thank you. The latest across the country today, the U.S. Department of Energy now believes with, quote, low confidence that the COVID pandemic was most likely the result of a lab leak in China. The DOE changed its stance from undecided to becoming the second U.S. agency after the F FBI to believe a lab accident resulted in the spread of the virus. Well, four other U.S. agencies believe the virus was a result of natural transmission. Two others are undecided. Epidemiologists say the evidence for lab leak or natural spillover theory is still limited. The DOE is not dismissing natural transmission theory, but lab leak theory is also now being investigated. Well, the conservative majority on the Supreme Court is likely to rule against President Biden's student loan forgiveness plan. The justices argued today for more than three hours. Chief Justice John Roberts led the charge in questioning the Biden administration's authority to cancel loans due to the pandemic. President Biden said Monday that he believes his loan forgiveness program is legal. Numerous Republican states sued the Biden administration over the plan, saying the president is overstepping his authority. The decision likely won't be released for a few months. And staying on Capitol Hill, the Biden administration urging Congress today to renew a surveillance program that the government says is crucial to protect, protection of national security. The program is under fire as it is linked to civil liberty advocates and some Republicans the under, under its Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, or FISA. It grants American spy agencies the ability to examine communications of foreigners who are outside of the U.S. Officials say FISA has helped with investigations into ransomware attacks, stopped efforts to recruit spies, and even helped in the killing of al-Qaeda leader Ayman Zahari last August. If Congress doesn't renew it, it will expire at the end of this year. Well, a federal judge has approved a $1 million settlement in a class action lawsuit. It's in response to the federal immigration raid that happened at an eastern Tennessee meatpacking plant five years ago. Over 100 people are arrested. The settlement is calling for the government to pay $475,000 to six individual plaintiffs. An additional $550,000 will go to the workers detained at the Bean Station plant in April of 2018. The lawsuit claims the Southeastern Provisions workers' Fourth and Fifth Amendment rights were violated when armed officers used racial slurs, shoved guns into the workers' faces, and even punched a worker in the face during the raid. It also says that white workers were not harmed that day. Well, it was one of the warmest Februarys on record here in central New York. How about March? I'll tell you more coming up after this. You're watching Citrus TV News live at 6, your campus news leader. Visit aarp.org slash caregiving for information on how to provide even better care for the person who wants to care of you. Dad? Just one minute, okay? Hey, Bobo, do trees tell each other stories? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I don't know that. Hey, why don't we go find out? Take naps? I couldn't tell you. Can birds draw pictures? I don't have an answer for that. Dad, do stars visit their friends? Look! From the Citrus TV Weather Center, this is SU's most accurate weather forecast. Welcome back to Citrus TV News Live at 6. Well, if you're in Syracuse, you're headed out to see the basketball game at the Dome tonight, I'm happy to report things will stay dry for the remainder of the night. All that precipitation that we saw here in central New York earlier has parted from us, but it is coming back tomorrow. So enjoy that while you can. For tomorrow, we're going to see a high of about 41 degrees, too warm for snow. But, you know, a spot shower on and off in the afternoon, I would say that after 1 or 2 o'clock, those showers are just going to kind of, you know, pop up and then go away. So if you're headed out, definitely grab the umbrella or the raincoat. That won't hurt. But things dry out again on Thursday. 
It's going to be just a mainly cloudy day. Nothing in the way of snow or rain for Thursday, but Friday, that's our next weather maker. So when we go in and, you know, look at Friday, we're seeing some snow that we don't have real exact measurements on yet, but it is going to start around 2 p.m. moving into the Syracuse area and uh, two to four inch totals by Friday night. The thing is that the system itself won't stop until Saturday. So you're going to see some rough travel going into Saturday as well as Sunday morning. So definitely something to uh, watch for and uh, tune into Citrus TV News live at six on Wednesday for maybe more information on this system. Saturday and Sunday things, uh, you know, not too great, but again, it could always be worse. High of around 40 degrees on Saturday with those spot flurries. And then Sunday we're looking at just a dusting uh, to maybe light trace of snow, uh, but nothing to write home about. Right now, with more on the snow, I'm going to send it back to Walker and Nicole. Well, Ronnie, you're right about that severe weather. It's happening like crazy today in Syracuse. Watch out for mixed rain and snow this afternoon. Expect icy roads and walkways on campus. Well, on the West Coast, too, we're still seeing record rainfall and flooding due to the California blizzard. Because of extreme winds, power outages, down trees, and whiteout conditions will continue into tomorrow morning. This is the same system moving in our direction right now. The weather has been awful. I drove to Cuyahoga County today. I watched a car flip over. It was awful. Like, thankfully, they're wow. okay, but like it was the roads are just awful. Thankfully, yeah. I've, I haven't had any horror stories so no. far today, but <laughs> I don't know. Syracuse basketball is playing, so hey, we never know. <laughs> Ian, what do you got for us? Well, look, Walker, it hasn't been a great year for Syracuse men's basketball, and they don't necessarily leap into the last week of the regular season with a ton of momentum. SU's lost three straight, but Jim Beheim still confident in his squad ahead of tonight's clash with Georgia Tech. Find out why when we come back. And now, your Citrus TV Sports Report. It's the final countdown for Syracuse men's basketball. Welcome into sports. I'm Ian Nicholas. The last few hours of SU season have been, well, ugly. Jim Beheim's crew has lost three straight by 17 or more points for the first time in over 60 years. The Cuse's two-game road trip last week provided a roadmap on how to peel the orange, shoot the three. Syracuse gave up over 90 points at both Clemson and Pittsburgh. The Tigers and Panthers roared from downtown, drilling 30 triples at a 39% clip. There's just two regular season contests left to turn things around, but Bayheim thinks it can be done. Played pretty good basketball overall. I think we're just too young to be consistent and to be good on the defensive end. It's just a struggle there for us, but I, I think we've done a lot of I'm, I'm pretty happy with what, what this team's done, and I think we'll finish strong. 
Someone who is finishing strong for Syracuse is Judah Mintz. The freshman averaged a team high 19 and a half points, three and a half assists, and shot 58% from the field last week. As a result, the point guard earned his fifth ACC Rookie of the Week honor. Mintz has a chance to stay hot against 12 and 17 Georgia Tech tonight in the Dome at 7. The Vitur of Syracuse women's lacrosse is 1-0 in ACC play and 1-0 on the road after a 12-goal thrashing at Pittsburgh Saturday. Kayla Trainer's crew is a perfect 4-0 for the third consecutive year, but regardless, SU sits behind number one North Carolina in the national rankings for the second week straight. The Cuse aims to stay spotless back in the 3-1-5 against UAlbany. Good news, the Orange are 15-0 all-time when facing the Great Danes. UAlbany is led by Syracuse legend Katie Rowan. The six-year head coach became the first SU women's lacrosse player to have her jersey retired last season. Opening draw for this year's showdown is tomorrow at 4. On the gridiron, Syracuse football has already been hit by the injury bug. Yesterday, quarterback Garrett Schrader announced that he'll miss the entirety of spring practice. SU starter underwent a successful procedure on his right elbow, which is on his throwing arm. Last fall, the second-year Orange missed just one of 13 starts. With the team captain sideline, Dino Babers turns to Carlos Del Rio Wilson and Justin Lampson under center. Del Rio Wilson started one game last season and threw for 340 yards after transferring from Florida. Meanwhile, Lampson was sidelined for all of 2022 with an injury of his own. Now, a team that's healthy and clicking on all cylinders in the NBA, the New York Knicks. Look at this dime from Julius Randle. He finds Quentin Grimes and Randle finish with a game-high 23 points. There's a trade that line acquisition Josh Hart and he finds Obi Toppin for the flush over the Celtics. Nick's up big late. Speaking of Hart, here's a three that well would really sting Boston deep. It would make J Jason Tatum's blood boil. He was ejected after his second technical foul of the game, his first career ejection. Now New York has an opportunity for win number seven in a row when it takes on Brooklyn tomorrow night. Now the Brooklyn Nets, before they take on New York tomorrow, they've got to play a really good good Bucks team today and let me tell you when I say really good I mean 15 wins in a row potentially that's the best win streak in the NBA this season and you get potentially the NBA's best player back tonight in Giannis Antetokounmpo he missed Sunday's win over Phoenix with a quad injury. Now sticking on the hardwood, former Syracuse standout Michael Carter Williams has signed with the Magic. The 2014 NBA Rookie of the Year was an All-American with the Orange 10 years ago. MCW agreed to a two-year deal with Orlando after playing portions of three seasons with the organization from 2018 to 2021. Ian, thank you. When we come back, we'll take one last look at your weather. Stay with us. Since I got rid of my car, I really enjoy walking. Okay. Got it. No, no. Getting pulled over for buzz driving could cost you around $10,000 in fines, legal fees, and increased insurance rates. Oh, you're home early. You live with your mom? That'll set your game back a few years. Buzzed, busted, and broke. Because buzz driving is drunk driving. Thank you. All right, your wake up weather, one last look at it. Tomorrow when you wake up and head out the door, things will be dry, but grab the raincoat. Rain is expected to come into central New York around 2 p.m. and temperatures topping off in the lower 40s tomorrow. Nicole and Walker, back over to you. Ronnie, thank you so much. Well, we end our newscast tonight. The mom who gave birth to the real elephant twins at Rosemont Gifford Zoo, she's turning 26 today. Her name's Molly. Wow, yeah. And if you guys don't <laughs> remember, we covered the story just a little yep. bit ago. She was 
she had two twins, and this is incredibly rare for an elephant. Oh yeah, less than one percent of twins yeah. worldwide. It's absolutely amazing. Happy birthday, Bob! Happy from birthday. all the Citrus TV news. All very exciting stuff. To you, stuff. happy birthday. <laughs> well, hey, that'll do it for our newscast tonight. For more of the latest, you can check us out online at CitrusTV.com or follow us on Twitter at Citrus TV News. For the entire Citrus TV News team, I'm Walker Simmons. I'm Nicola Ponte. Good night.